Welcome to the Tuesday edition of the Morning Pit. We're here. It's Tennessee game week. The backyard brawl is in the past, and Tennessee is on tap. Panthers set to host the Volunteers at Acroshore Stadium this Saturday at 3.30 p.m., and all the focus is turning toward that Tennessee game. It's a huge game for Pitt. we still got some things to wrap up with the backyard brawl, even though we're, we're closing in on almost a week since that game last Thursday. So what, five days since that game? It seems like the distant past especially with a long holiday weekend in between. So we're looking ahead and also bringing things up to speed, recapping uh, a few final thoughts from that West Virginia game, partially based on what we heard from Pat Narduzzi yesterday. So we got a lot to talk about here on the Morning Pit on YouTube.com slash PantherLair.com. Remember, we do this show every morning, Monday through Friday. We sit down and for 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes, half hour, however long it takes, we talk about everything going on in pit sports, whatever you need to get caught up on to start your day. The beginning of the summer, we started doing the weekly recap or the weekend recap every Monday morning, just to kind of bring you up to speed on the weekend and set the tone for the week. Then we decided uh, two weeks ago to expand it to a daily offering here on youtube.com slash pantherlaircom. You want to make sure you never miss uh, any of these videos. You can click that subscribe button right there. Of course, that'll also give you notification when we go live for our Panther Lair show, our weekly Panther Lair show, which we do every Wednesday night at 8.30, and also our post-game shows. We'll have one on Saturday after the Tennessee game, a few hours after the Tennessee game, because I'll be at Acroshore Stadium covering the game, and then post-game press conference till I get back to the PantherLair.com offices, uh, maybe grab a cold one uh, and sit down. It might be a couple hours after the end of the game. Never know really a specific time on when we'll start. You hit that subscribe button, you'll get a notification, you'll know when we go live it certainly came in handy on thursday night slash friday morning when we went for our live show after the backyard brawl i think we started around 1 30 or 1 35 in the morning I, I had a rough estimate on the time when we would start but i wasn't exactly sure when it would be uh, if you were subscribed to our youtube channel youtube.com slash pantherlair.com you got a notification you knew when we went live your phone would tell you like hey man pantherlair they're going live tune in for a crazy, weird, late night, early morning chat about the backyard brawl. So make sure you do that. And of course, like this video. We can't thank you enough for that. And pantherlair.com, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. The most compre comprehensive source of Pitt sports news on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting. We provide the content. You digest that content and go to the message boards and talk about it with other Pitt fans. Panther-lair.com. Com, pittsburgh.rivals.com so it's tuesday and we're looking back at pat narduzzi's monday press conference he holds it every week every monday at noon and narduzzi was there yesterday in the south side and <laughs> maybe the most notable thing about this as i told my kids when i got home from the press conference pat narduzzi used the s word three times now he used it as an adjective it wasn't the noun, it was the adjective version, and because we're trying to keep this, I, I, I clicked the button on YouTube that says these videos are not for kids, but we're going to try and keep it clean here, we're going to try to uh, uh, not have any obscenity, so we'll just say that it was the S word in an adjective form, and in Pitt's official transcript, they went with crappy as the uh, alternative. There, there's a lot of words they could have gone with, stinky, rotten, lousy, icky, stinking, Cheap, contemptible, grotty, inferior, miserable, pathetic, and poor. Now, poor was my suggestion after the uh, press conference when, uh, you know, knowing that they, Pitt would put out a uh, official transcript from the press conference. I told Pitt, Borg uh, <laughs> Pitt Borghetti, that's his Twitter name, at Pitt Borghetti, EJ Borghetti, the Pitt Sports Information Director. I told him, uh, you know, I, I recommend poor as your substitute. I, I'm sure you're not going to leave the actual word in the transcript. I recommend poor as a substitute. He ultimately went with crappy in all three instances. It would have been funny if he used a different adjective for each one. But nevertheless, it was some strong language, some harsh language from Pat Narduzzi. And the first time he said it came in a question about not handling adversity, but handling success. Uh, it was something Sarvasi Dennis had said after uh, the game on, on Thursday night that the team last year had to learn about how to handle success. They beat Clemson and then they go out and lose to Miami. How do you handle success? And so Pat Narduzzi was asked about it and he said, quote, but you know, I think handling success this week when you kind of played crappy, let's just put it that way. I think it makes it a little bit easier. 
And then later, uh, he was asked about the run defense, and we'll talk about this in a second. He says, uh, well, it starts with the coaches. It starts with me. Anytime we're crappy, it starts right here. Crappy head coach. It trickles down and not making plays. Let's go back to the original point, though, about when you played crappy, it makes it a little bit easier uh, to handle success. That was Narduzzi's point. And, and I really, I, I feel like I even said something along these lines over the summer and through training camp that... Uh, when I talked about my expectations for the West Virginia game, I thought Pitt would win, but I thought it'd be sloppy. I thought it'd be the kind of game that they come out of with a victory, and so the coaches are happy, but enough teaching moments on film that they could really get after the players during the you know post-game film breakdowns and the team meetings and position meetings. And I definitely thought that after the game, that the coaches were more than pleased to walk out of Acker Shore Stadium with a victory. But when they went back into the Southside facility on Friday to start breaking down film and breaking down with the players over the weekend, there were going to be a few raised voices. And there were going to be a few key teaching points uh, to make. And while I think Pat Narduzzi would certainly prefer a far cleaner performance, I think he'd prefer a far, you know, something much closer to perfect, even though perfect is unattainable. I don't think he entirely hates coming out of a game where there are things to get on the players about. You know, there are things to get on the wide receivers about with the routes that they were running. There are things to get on the outside linebackers about with their run fits and their alignments. There are things to get on the offensive line about with their blocking assignments. There there are things to get on. Just about every position group is going to have some, you know, teaching moments that came out of that game. And I don't think he entirely hates that. To come out of a win, a good win, a win over a rival against a Power 5 non-conference opponent and be able to go in and say, You screwed this up, you screwed that up, you screwed this up, you screwed that up. We went over this a hundred times, we went over that a hundred times, we went over this, we went over that, and you and you messed that up. We need to hammer on this, we need to hammer on that. I don't think coaches hate that kind of situation. And I think Pat Narduzzi is certainly one of those coaches who looks forward to being able to teach off a game. And I think while you while he may be frustrated about those moments, those lapses and you know, lack of attention to details it's probably a little more palatable or a little more enjoyable to teach on those moments when it's after a win. You can almost sort of approach it with, guys, we got lucky. We got lucky to win this game because we put ourselves in jeopardy a lot of times. Whether it was how we, you know, we we have a blocked punt down near the goal line. Um, It was missing on opportunities for turnovers. It was turning the ball over ourselves. It was sacks. It was, you know, lack of composure. There are a lot of things to teach on out of that game, and you can really take an approach, like Narduzzi said, of saying, we played crappy. You know, There's no talk about handling success. He said, I wasn't dancing in the locker room. There's no talk about handling success uh, or no concern about that because the success was really just a win, and it's not like you played a great game. And so if you think you're going to be able to walk on the field and play like you did against West Virginia when you take on Tennessee and escape with the same fortunate outcome, you better think again. Now, I do think, so I don't, I I think Pat Narduzzi embraces that kind of a situation. I don't think it's all an act though. I think the run defense definitely drives him crazy. I, I think it drives him up a wall. And he said it after the game, when he was asked about run defense, he said, I'm hot. I am hot right now. And he's not talking in like the Paris Hilton sense. Uh, he's not talking about uh, the temperature in the room. He's talking about hot under the collar. And and I think it drives him absolutely bonkers when teams are able to run the ball on Pitt's defense, as well it should. They give up a whole heck of a lot in the past defense to stop the run, to make sure that they stop the run. And he had a funny comment. Uh, on Monday when he said uh, that, um, you know, it's different to be asked about the run defense. He says, for years and years, you guys only want to ask me about the pass defense. And what's wrong with the pass defense? You never asked me about the run. It's a nice change of pace. And and the point there, whether he knows he's making it or not, is that we haven't had to ask him about the run defense over the years. They've been really good against the run. The design of this defense has worked in its primary goal, which is stopping the run. Now, they've gotten torched three ways to Sunday, through the air with the passing game but they have been really good at stopping the run and and that's by design And, and part of that is why and i've said this a few times since thursday night i'm not too concerned about the run defense i think there's enough evidence that you you know 
uh, of success in this defense stopping the run that I think you know it's reasonable to give the coaches the benefit of the doubt and that they will figure it out um, and, and resolve some of the issues that arose. I thought Pat Narduzzi made an interesting point during his Monday press conference also when he said he thought they just had too much stuff in the defense. Too many sort of, uh, I mean, just too many different plays and, and sets put in because they didn't know what West Virginia was going to do. And so they wanted to almost sort of account for every possibility. And it's, you know, overload of information, particularly when you have two new starters at outside linebacker, which is, seems to be where most of the issues stemmed from in stopping those outside runs, particularly by, uh, what was his name, C.J. Donaldson, the freshman tight end who ran for 125 yards and a touchdown on seven carries. And so I thought that was an interesting point too. Season opener against a talented opponent you, with a brand new offensive coordinator. You don't know what they're going to do. And so you put in a lot of stuff to sort of account for everything. And in the process, maybe you lose some of the details. You lose some of the finer points that you might have if you have a smaller playbook to work with where you can really be sort of experts at it. And as you transition then into Tennessee, uh, and Pat Narduzzi made this point, they faced this offense before. They faced Tennessee last season, and then they faced basically the same offense at UCF in 2018 and 2019. And so they're familiar with what Tennessee is going to want to do. They know that there will be adjustments. Things will always change year to year. But for the most part, they know what Tennessee is going to want to do. Whether they can actually stop it remains to be seen, or at least hold it under 35, which is probably, you know, I, I think if Pitt's defense holds Tennessee under 35, I think they should have a pretty good chance to win, You know, relying on the offense to figure some things out of its own. And we talked about that yesterday with Keaton Slovis. We'll talk about it more as the week goes on. But they do have some more familiarity here. And so maybe you're able to pare, you're able to pare down the playbook a little bit. You're able to focus in on some more details. And I do think you should see improvement in those areas. Talking about the run defense. Now, Tennessee is going to present a whole new challenge for those outside linebackers when they attack them with the pass. And that's going to get a lot more challenging, whether it's the tight ends or the slot. That could be a whole, it's it, its own brand of, uh, let's let's go back to our list of synonyms here. It could be its own brand of stinky, rotten, lousy, icky, stinking, crappy, cheap, contemptible, grotty, inferior, miserable, pathetic, poor. <laughs> When, when they start attacking those outside linebackers with the pass. But they should resolve some of the issues with the run. We'll see how that looks uh, on Saturday at Akershore Stadium. Uh, new depth chart released on Monday, as it will be every Monday. Really only one change, and it's the most curious change of all. They added an or at starting running back between Israel Banacanda and Rodney Hammond. Last week, it was a Banacanda, Hammond, Vincent Davis or Sebo Flemister. Now it's a Banacanda or Rodney Hammond, Davis or Flemister. And this is a very curious change. Now, it certainly reflects what happened in the game. Rodney Hammond was the man. You know, he was he was the offensive MVP of that game, or, you know, I, I think pretty clearly their best player on offense. 74 yards and two touchdowns on 16 carries, and uh 55 yards on two receptions. So you're looking at 120. 129 yards of total offense and uh, two touchdowns. Great game for Rodney Hammond. He should be a co-starter, if not the starter, as far as listing on the depth chart. I'm still holding on to my Izzy Abanacanda predictions and projections, but, I mean, Rodney Hammond was clearly the best back in that game. It's curious that they move him to an or, though, when he very clearly suffered an, inju suffered an injury at the end of the game, came out into the post-game press conference in a walking boot, and you'd have to think his status is kind of up in the air for this game. Now, maybe making him an or starter is part of the gamesmanship of trying to convince Tennessee that he's going to play. I was very curious to make that move right now. Now, we've learned over the years that these depth charts mean very little in terms of what we'll actually see. Oftentimes, it is uh, the depth chart reflects the previous week more than it reflects what you should expect to see in the coming week. So, to that extent, since it looked like they were sort of on a you know Abanacanda Hammond rotating every quarter system. I mean, they were almost sort of co-starters last week. So maybe it more reflects that than it does anything we expect to see this week. But that was really the only change on the depth chart. And I mean, when we talk about, you know, 
the depth chart, how it doesn't really reflect reality. I mean, they continue to list Gabe Hoy as the starter at right tackle, backed by Matt Gonsalves and Jason Collier. When the reality that we saw last week is Hoy suited up, did not play. Gonsalves started. And when they pulled Gonsalves for the final like drive or two, I guess it was the final drive, Branson Taylor, who's the listed backup at left tackle, came in and took over at right tackle and actually played well. And, and I'll be curious to see what, happens at right tackle this week I don't know if Gabe Hoy is going to be back my guess is he won't be and so you're looking at Gonsalves again but I'm, I'm curious if it's Gonsalves and Taylor maybe in a bit more of a rotation and that's really a pain in the butt because eights and sixes are hard to tell apart and so you know Gonsalves and they're both big guys Gonsalves wears 76 Taylor weighs 78 I'm gonna have to really I'm gonna have, to have the binoculars out for that one we're gonna be keeping an eye on the eights and the sixes to see who plays what and how often they uh swap out on defense the uh the the two deep is is what it was last week more or less reflects what we actually saw in the game it was curious to see aj woods didn't really play after the second quarter on thursday night i didn't notice him getting hurt i'm not sure what happened there um he's still listed as the starter on the depth chart they they have a bunch of oars all over the you know in in the defensive line they have you know, Hava Baldonado is the starter at DN with Dayon Hayes or Nate Temple backing him up. Hayes and Temple both played on Thursday night. Deven- the one defensive tackle spot, they have Devin Danielson or David Green backed by DeAndre Jules. All three of those guys played. They played 10 defensive linemen on defense in that game. For, according to my calculations, if I added this up right, and, and I mean, I, it's scribbled here on this paper. I don't know if you can see it very well. 23 defensive line combinations. 23 different ways they split up those 10 guys. Now, none of those combinations played more than seven snaps together, but 23 different combinations. I'm going to track this again after the Tennessee game and see if they go quite so hog wild on, you know, using. So- we know they like to rotate, but rotating usually, you know, two guys at a time or, or subbing out four for four. There were, you know, one guy in, one guy out, one guy in, one guy out. And you're, you're changing, and, and not even in the middle of drives. It would be, you know, four guys go out there for one drive. And on the next drive, two of those guys are out there, two other guys, or three are out, still out there, and one other guy's out there. Only one is still out there from the previous drive, and three new guys come out. It, it was it was wild. It was, like I said, 23 different combinations. And I couldn't tell you which one was the best. I mean, you can look at plays and production and touchdowns and stuff like that, but... It was very curious to see how many defensive line combinations they used. And, you know, granted, I said they had 10 defensive linemen that they used. I mean, Nate Temple and DeAndre Jules played six snaps each. So it's not like all those guys were getting 10 or 15 or 20 snaps, but they still were able to go in and, and, and take a few plays, which particularly was useful at defensive end after Deslin Alexander got hurt. And we'll see what his status is um, for this week going forward. But, the depth along the defensive line is very real. We talked about it all summer, and it's very much a thing now that the season has started. The, the rotation at linebacker, though, not so much. As a matter of fact, Sabasi Dennis played all but one snap in the game. Bengali Kamara played all but two snaps in the game. And Shane Simon wasn't in the Delta defensive package. That's the package they used on third and long. But in the base defense snaps... Shane Simon played all but one of the base defense snaps at that money linebacker spot. And the only reason he came off for that one snap is because his helmet came off. There's not a lot of rotation there. Now, linebackers, they were missing Brandon George, so you didn't have him available at middle linebacker. Maybe he would have rotated in more. Maybe Stravasia Dennis would have played a little outside if George was available and kind of move those guys around. That didn't happen. Um... When Dennis came out for one snap on late in West Virginia's final drive, he got hurt. He came off the field. Nick Lappy came in and played one snap, and then Dennis came back out to finish the game. What's curious is when, if you look at the depth chart, Bengali Kamar is a listed starter at star linebacker, and Solomon DeShields backs him up. Shane Simon is a listed starter at money linebacker. Tyler Wiltz backs him up. When Kamara came off for two snaps, it was one drive. It was a two. It was the drive that ended with Marquez Williams forcing a fumble. It was a two-play drive. That drive, they went with Tyler Wiltz as the star linebacker, even though he's listed as the backup at money linebacker. Similarly, when Shane Simon had to come out because his helmet came off, Solomon DeShields went on the field at the money linebacker, despite the fact that he's listed as the star 
backup. So we're getting really in the weeds here on minutia when it comes to design position designations and all that. But I guess I'm offering all this as a way to say these depth charts, man, just don't always have a connection to reality. <laughs> Sometimes you you feel like they're throwing darts, and I don't think that's entirely the case. I think they I think there's a method to the madness. I'll just be darned if I can figure it out myself. I should have looked up a synonym for darned and found a better way to say that. But I can't figure out that uh, method myself, but that's what it is. I, I do think there will be more rotation at linebacker going forward. I think Wilts will get more snaps. DeShields will get more snaps. But you're facing a tough offense here. You're facing a tough offense in Tennessee. Are you are you going to break in Tyler Wilts in his, you know, his jump from FCS uh, – up to power five football are you going to break him in against tennessee you know an sec team are you going to break in solomon shields who granted hasn't played that much less than bengali kamara but kamara at least has a game under his belt he's been on the field for 74 snaps i think he played um, in that game against west virginia so he's got that experience at least i, I think coaches want to rotate want to get guys in want to use young players but then they get in the game and every snap feels so precious every snap feels so crucial that they just get terrified of the idea of blowing it on a younger player that they put it in an inexperienced guy and that guy misses the tackle or makes the misread or misses the communication or has a bad alignment or a bad fit and it ends up going for a big play that changes the game i think that's what they get scared of uh, maybe that's the advantage of having uh, uh, you know Rhode Island to open the season, UMass to open the season, Villanova, you know Youngstown State, whoever it is to open the season, so that you can kind of break in some of those younger players and get them a game of experience before they dive into the deep end of the pool. Well, this year you're diving into the deep end twice, you know, with West Virginia and Tennessee to open things up, and so there's not a lot of easing into it for Kamara. And Shane Simon, who is an older player but is still new to this defense, or DeShields or, or Wilts. But these guys are going to have to play. You're not going to be able to go Shane Simon for all but one snap in the base defense every game. You're not going to be able to go Bengali Kamara for all but two snaps overall because he played in the base and the delta package. He was on the field for all but two of Pitt's defensive snaps. You're not going to be able to go Sarasia Dennis for all but one snap. You'd probably like to. Maybe with all three of those guys, but you're going to have to rotate. It's a long season, and these are long games. And not everybody's going to be uh, you know, nice and slow like West Virginia was. How many plays did they end up running? They ran 73 plays. You know, Tennessee is going to top that. They're going to have a lot of plays out there. You're going to need rest um, that you're, you know, in between, you know, between drives because you're not going to get rest in between the plays. You're not going to have that, you know, few extra seconds to catch your breath. You're going to need to drive off here and there. And you're going to need to get that rotation going. And I think, you know, I think they probably would like to do a little more rotation in the secondary as well. The corners, they they rotated them around. We'll see if AJ Woods is limited or out or anything like that. But the safeties, Eric Hallett played every snap. Brandon Hill missed a handful of snaps. He tapped out a little bit late at the at the end. Um, but they're going to need to rotate those guys as well. They've got a great rotation going on the defensive line, but the back seven is going to need to continue developing a rotation of its own. So we'll see how that plays out, not just this week against Tennessee, but you know, over the course of the season, I think it's going to be one of those sort of bigger arc storylines that we watch develop as this team moves through the 2022 season. So that's the reactions to uh, Panarduzzi's comments on Monday, reaction to the new two deep that came out, and um, some thoughts there on the defensive rotations. We'll have a lot to cover all week as we get ready for this game against Tennessee. More talk about the offense, what they need to do to figure it out. We'll have interviews with players and coaches today and tomorrow, and we'll have some reactions to what those guys have to say. We'll have a preview of Tennessee later in the week. We'll cover some recruiting stuff. I said this yesterday, I'm really excited about doing these videos every day because we've got a ton of stuff to talk about. Now, when it's you know late February, I guess we'll have basketball to discuss, uh, but I don't know if it's going to provide daily fodder like uh, football is right now, so it'll be interesting to see where we go then. But right now, it's, it's exciting because there's a lot of stuff to talk about. There are a lot of storylines every day that we can break down, and uh, I'm glad you tune in for the Morning Pit to catch up on all of it. Listen, make sure you subscribe 
to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. You'll never miss any of our exclusive pit video content, whether it's interviews, analysis, the morning pit episodes, our live Panther Lair show we do every Wednesday night at 8.30 right here on youtube.com slash pantherlair.com or the uh, post-game shows that we're going to do after the games. We'll all sit down in a live video stream setting. You'll post your comments and questions in the chat screen and we'll, uh, we'll have a little conversation about the game, a little back and forth like we did on Thursday night early Friday morning after the backyard brawl. That was a lot of fun, and uh, we had a lot of people online. A lot more than I expected to have at 2 in the morning on the Thursday night. I really didn't think we would draw that kind of audience, but it was it was a great crowd, and it was a lot of fun. So I appreciate everybody who came out for that one, and I appreciate you watching this video. Make sure you stay tuned at pantherlair.com, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. It is the most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting. It's all going on there at pantherlair.com. So tune in, panther-lair.com. Go discuss pit sports on the message boards. We put out a lot of content on pantherlair.com. Articles, interviews, recruiting, analysis, evaluation, all that kind of stuff. You get to consume that content and then talk about it on the message boards. So thanks uh, for checking out this video. We will see you on Wednesday morning. Uh, we will see you on the message boards at pantherlair.com. So have a good uh, have a good rest of the day on Tuesday. We'll talk to you tomorrow for the morning pit right here on youtube.com slash pantherlair.com.